after hours upon hours of questing, killing, selling, grouping up, dungeoneering and bubble harping, we've reached the final milestone. We're now a level 60 paladin. Outstanding! Congratulations come pouring in from all of our friends and guildmates, if we have any. And we just sit there for a short while, happy, at peace, complete. As a level 60, our main objective now is to gear up sufficiently enough to be allowed into raids. This means waiting around in Stormwind quite a bit until we can find a group to go somewhere with. We're now one of those endgame players you've seen who just stand around in the square all day doing nothing. Every even level, the paladin trainer up in the cathedral has had a new ability or spell to teach us. And now it's time to see what he's got for us this one final time. The path to get more training is so well trodden at this point that maybe we don't see it at first. The big quest icon on the way in. The Thorian Rawl is an old friend who had in the past given us our class quests. We last spoke to him some 20 levels ago when he gave us the ability to summon our war horses for free. But he also said at the time that a much greater challenge awaited us. This must be that. It's time for us to acquire the ultimate symbol of our paladinhood, a charger. The charger is a very fast mount alongside the other epic mounts available from the game's many stables. If a player wanted to skip this quest and just pay over a thousand gold at the stables instead, they could do so, but they'd be cowards. We're directed to our trainer in the other room, Lord Grayson Shadowbreaker. He tells us that the following quest isn't some learning exercise like previously. Our education is complete after all. We're level 60. No, this time we're going on a proper quest. We'll need to find and befriend the horse ourselves. But let's not get too carried away here. This quest is a serious undertaking and will require a lot of prep work. The first item we need is a exorcism sensor, a lantern-esque device that clergymen use to burn incense during exorcisms. To obtain one, we need to show, quote, due sacrifice and prove our piety to receive the sensor. So, in other words, we have to buy it. The high priest in Ironforge, Rohan, is willing to sell one to us, so let's head over there. It's time to get back on the tram again. Nowadays we have quite a lot of gold coins jingling around in our pockets, so we typically pay for a griffin to take us over the mountains rather than rely on dirty public transport to take us under. But sometimes it's nice to stretch our legs and embrace a ritual from our earlier adventures. Maybe the route reminds us of Verigan's Fist and all of the friends we made along the way. Oh look, we're here. Let's wipe away that solitary tear and head on over to the Mystic Ward. 150 gold. This is daylight robbery, no doubt, but there's no other option. The quest completion text says that the donation was far beyond what was needed. So why did we spend 150 then? I am livid. Sensor in hand, it's time to get back onto the tram to Stormwind. I've mentioned this before, but I really do believe there is something in being made to wait in games. Each tram or boat journey I've always used as a sort of meditative practice, to reflect on my journeys, to prepare for the future, and to think about what I want for dinner. It provides an immersive effect that a long loading screen just wouldn't give. When back at the cathedral, Shadowbreak finally lets us in on what this was for. We're to use the sensor to help exorcise the evil spirits of Terradale. The settlement has a comically evil name, I know, but go easy on the place. There were few areas hit harder by the scourge. To this day, it's infested with all sorts of awful undead, and it's our job to start cleansing the place. This is a good look into what the function of a paladin actually is in the Warcraft universe, to provide religious functions too dangerous for a monk or a priest, and to help reclaim the vast northern lands lost to the zombie apocalypse. Terradale is in the eastern Plaguelands, not far from the infamous city of Stratholme, and so there's a long flight ahead of us. Let's go. When first playing World of Warcraft, one thing that fascinated me was an almost complete lack of border zones. Not only could you go from Stormwind to Terradale without hitting a single loading screen, but you could fly above the continent and see everything below interconnected. We're too high in the sky for us to see anything rendered in, but they're there, and that means something. The less loading screens an open world has, the more immersive it is, and it's hard to articulate why, honestly, but it's like a passive effect that makes every bit of exploration feel better. Whether you're Alliance or Horde, the furthest a Flightmaster will dare take you is to the Light's Hope Chapel, a secluded building guarded by the Argent Dawn, a military order dedicated to cleansing the Plaguelands, just like what we're about to do. But we're not going that way, we're actually landing at another one of the outposts, Chillwind Camp, quite a way over in the Western Plaguelands. This is because the scenery is far more comfy, which has always been a high priority for my journeys, and because it gives me more time to ramble. 
Usually I'm fond of sticking to the road, but the one eastward from here would take us through what little is left of Anderhall, an incredibly dangerous place that you'd have to be very brave to enter alone. Instead, let's take a stroll through this graveyard just off the side of the road, which in true RPG fashion is full of undead. At the back is a particularly large tomb. Let's get distracted and take a closer look. This solitary patch of land nestled away against the mountains is the tomb of Uther the Lightbringer, one of the first paladins and perhaps the greatest. He was murdered by his own student at the height of the Scourge invasion, yet the place never lost its natural vigour. It's a welcome getaway. All of these surrounding lands were once a part of the human kingdom of Lordaeron. It seems to once have been a very peaceful and tranquil place, now deeply corrupted and haunted by the tragic events of the past. The survival of the foliage, despite the utter desolation of all sentient life, makes the place eerie, especially when the rain mists up. As someone who usually plays a human, and who has a rough recollection of the events of Warcraft 3, the place invites a melancholy. The great emptiness of these plague lands makes me think of the lands of the once great Kingdom of Arnor, of the Third Age of Middle-earth. Over every hill is a reminder of what once was, though sadly for us, there is no equivalent to Bree here for respite. Not if you don't count a few tents and a battered old church at least. Passing through the bridge which divides east and west, let's take an immediate left. This trail leads down a shortcut to Terradale. At the end of the trail is a ruined old house by a waterfall, and a man with a hammer. This man is very important, but I've gone on way too many tangents recently, so let's just say for now that he is unusually tall. Between us and Terradale is the Terra Web Tunnel, a cave infested with crypt fiends, resurrected Nerubians, a race of human spider hybrids that looked disgusting alive, never mind undead. This cave would usually be quite tough to fight through, though as paladins we have special abilities like exorcism and holy wrath which we can use to really teach them a lesson. We didn't take the easiest route, I know, but for me it was the most familiar, as their Crypt Fiend parts were needed for getting certain powerful items from the Argent Dawn. All of Terradale's inhabitants are long, long dead. Aside from Egan and Augustus the Touched, they occupy one of the houses near the cave entrance. Egan is part of a dungeon quest for the nearby Straton, and Augustus is a vendor who sells a few miscellaneous items, should you collect his recipe book from what's left of the local inn. Most notably he sells a lucky grab bag, a kind of loot box, that is quite expensive and contains one of 62 items, of which none are particularly impressive. Neither of these NPCs are related to our quest, but I felt like I had to acknowledge them. Around the town are many green auras. These are places where we need to use our sensor. Wafting around the sensor's incense on these auras will cause the tormented spirits of Terradale's former inhabitants to attack you, and when defeated, they're finally laid to rest. A total of 25 spirits need to be put down before our work can be deemed sufficient for the next step of our quest. This can take quite a while, and so by the time I was finished with this quest, I was quite sick of Terradale and half-stoned back home. It always feels good to be back in the city after a long trek into danger. After reporting our success to Lord Grayson Shadowbreaker, he gives us our next step. No Paladin's Charger is very good at charging if it's not armoured, so we need to make it some barding, and only the best craftsmanship will do. He recommends that we go to the best in town, a dwarf named Grimmond Elmore. We can find Grimmond in the Dwarven district, not far from the entrance to the Deep Run Tram, and he quickly warns us that his calibre of work does not come cheaply, but that it is the very best. The rare materials required to make the barding aren't the kind he just has lying around either. We'll have to go and source it all by ourselves, and that's not counting the fee he'll actually be taking for the work, which is 150 gold, so we're down 300 already. Our main concern should really be with the items we need to collect for him though. They are 5 bottles of Stratholm Holy Water, 10 Arthas Tears, 40 Rune Cloth, and 6 Arcanite Bars. Let's start with the Arcanite Bars, by far the worst of the lot. Arcanite bars are created by transmutation, the work of an advanced alchemist. The process requires a thorium bar, which is not too hard to come by, and an arcane crystal, which is very hard to come by. Players with the mining profession will find the crystals in rich thorium veins, rare nodes of ore that can spawn in the game's late zones, like Winterspring or the Eastern Plaguelands. An evening of mining can sometimes not yield even a single crystal, but once you've acquired one, from a vein or elsewhere, the crafting needs to be done. I've yet to meet an alchemist paladin, so assuming we have to find someone else to perform the transmutation for us, we have to be prepared to spend even more money. This is because the spell to create an arcanite bar has a 48 hour cooldown. My method was to rely on a friend to do the six transmutations for me, 
It took 12 days to get the bars I needed, but it was well worth the wait, and gave me ample evenings to gather the other materials. Other players won't be as lucky as me though, and will have to rely on other alchemists to do the work for them. If you relied on strangers to transmute the bars, they'd charge a dear price, and even your guildmates couldn't do it for free. The spell was just too important. Arcanite bars were incredibly essential to crafting the end game equipment so many incredibly powerful items could be made from the stuff, and it was even an important ingredient in the smelting of the legendary Elementium. The amount of Arcanite gear that a guild would have would correlate with their performance in raids and dungeons, so why would they delay this distribution of gear by six bars just so you can have a shiny horse? Despite this, I do really enjoy the idea of using methods like this to slow down the progression of the game. Creating the Sulfuron Hammer, for example, will set you back 50 Arcanite bars, and no matter how many hours you invest into the game, that cooldown won't go away any faster, and the making of the hammer won't come closer. Not unless you're ready to be bled absolutely dry, at the auction house at least. Tangentially, this is why players don't like gold buying from parallel markets. If you consider obtaining the legendary Sulfurous Hand of Ragnaros one of the ultimate win conditions of vanilla World of Warcraft, as I do, and gold coins greatly accelerate your progress towards that goal, a fundamental problem in the game's progression is created when you are able to buy that gold with real money. Anyway, on to the next item on the list, 40 Rune Cloth. This one is very easy. Runecloth is an item that drops from humanoid enemies from level 50 onwards. Adventure anywhere near places like Blackrock Mountain and the stuff will practically flow into your bags. I always had a few stacks of this stuff back in the bank, but players working on their first aid or tailoring skills may be short, as they need that material for crafting bandages and clothing. We also need 10 Arthur's Tears, a flower that grows primarily in the Plaguelands. It's usually only used in a couple of potions, neither of which I've actually heard of before, though it's always in very low demand. This means that if you wanted to snatch them off of the auction house, you could probably do so for a very reasonable price. In realms with a smaller economy, however, demand for the tears may be so low that no tears are even listed for auction. If this is an issue, perhaps an acquaintance on your friends list could help, or one of your guild's herbalists. They'll usually trade over quite a few on their way to more valuable flowers, so I don't think they'd mind picking up a few on your behalf. There is also poetry in its name. Arthas, who led the Scourge to destroy and corrupt the Plaguelands, at least left behind these. Perhaps all that was good within Arthas left him at that time, and was wept along the fields. And last, but certainly not least on the list, are the five bottles of Stratholm Holy Water. We got dangerously close to the place earlier on in our journey when we'd visited Terradale. It was once the great human city of the north, and now it's a huge dungeon instance. It now acts as the centre of the undead in the Plaguelands, and over the years attempts have been made to purify its ghoulish inhabitants. These attempts left behind some of their supplies in crates, and luckily for us, these supplies contain the holy water we need. Technically, this is the only material for the barding which we can't just buy from the auction house, so it's time to leave Stormwind and get a flight back up north past the Thandor span. To those who primarily play single player games, the idea of skipping parts of a quest by simply buying the required items from other players may seem a bit silly, and there was a time where I would have agreed, but World of Warcraft's end game shift into interaction with the economy is for a reason, to make it so that everyone relies on something for something. Only herbalists can gather the herbs, which only alchemists can then make into potions. Only miners can procure the ore, which blacksmiths then make into weapons and armour. Only enchanters can make proper use of all of the green items that drop that nobody wants, and only tailors can make the big bags that everyone needs. In order to progress past the max level, everyone has to work together. I did a stint as a herbalist, and I spent hours galloping around winter spring on the lookout for Black Lotus, so I could give them to my guild as alchemists. Because when it came to raid night and everyone downed their flasks, I felt like I'd contributed. This feeling of integration into a community is a great feeling which the endgame promotes. But of course, it's just a game, and maybe I shouldn't have spent hours every week picking flowers. We've arrived at Light's Hope Chapel, the only proper semblance of order left in the Eastern Plaguelands. The road north and then west to Stratholm is quite dangerous, not only from patrols of elite NPCs, but also players of the other faction, as Stratholm is a very popular dungeon and there's lots of ore veins and flora in the area for wandering miners and herbalists to search for. The Pestilent Scar is a great wound in the landscape, and it blocks our direct route, so we have to take a detour and then skirt around Corrin's Crossing to find the road north, making sure to keep our distance. The settlement is no longer fit for its name. As we pass this arch, we enter into the Plaguewood, and the terrain becomes warped even further. 
Any evidence of the temperate forest of days long gone has faded away. The whole landscape looks sickly, and huge mushrooms have sprouted up which look disgusting and diseased, spouting toxic gases from rotting holes that make me want to bubble half. Eventually, we've reached the entrance to the lost city. The front of the place looks eerily similar to Stormwind, but from a twisted nightmare. Years later, the fires still burn, the place trapped in its dark past. Heading in, we can see that the whole city still glows red from the fires, and the air is still thick with smoke and embers. When Arthas learned that grain shipments contaminated with the undead plague had already made their way into Stratholm, he made the decision to cull its population before they could all be transformed into ghouls. This happened in the event of Warcraft 3, released in 2002, and fans of the franchise still debate the morality of this decision. Do the ends justify the means? Is it acceptable to commit genocide against thousands of innocents, if in doing so you prevent greater future atrocities? What would the Eastern Kingdoms look like now if the culling had never taken place? I don't know, I'm just here for the quest. Despite great efforts in the past to prevent it, this city is absolutely infested with undead, and now it's our problem. There are crates littered all about each street, some of which you can open. Opening the supply crate will likely make this happen. But there's a chance that the goods are undamaged and you get a load of supplies, and importantly for us, a bottle or two of holy water. Clearing all of the city streets a couple of times should land you the five bottles that Grim and Elmore need to make us our body. And so when we've got them, we should head back again to the southern safety of Stormwind and have a word with him. Heading back over to the Dwarven District and handing in the Holy Water, Arthur's Tears, Rune Cloth, Arcanite Bars and 150 Gold, he'll make us the barding for our new charger. Instantaneously. We receive the finished product and are told to pass on a thanks to Lord Grayson for giving him the business, and since we're now headed back up to the Cathedral anyway, why not? Grayson calls us a resourceful paladin for obtaining the barding, and after all we've been through, that's the least of it. Now we have the armour ready, we can finally get to work on finding the actual horse. Before we actually go searching for one though, our barding needs to be blessed. This is because our future mount will be reclaimed from the grasp of evil, and it will be a shade of its former self, so I imagine the barding will just fall straight through it. To bring it back into reality, we require the blessing of a powerful entity of the spirit world. The best spirit to ask would be one of a horse, and Grayson knows of one, the ancient equine spirit who inhabits Dire Maul. The spirit has been stolen away by the evil treant Tendris Warpwood, and we'll need to get over there and kill it if we want to get our charger. Dire Maul is far away in the game's other continent, Kalimdor. But before we head over there, we need to pick up one more thing, mana enriched horse feed. All of this talk of monsters and ancient spirits can distract us from the fact that we're dealing with horses, and we'll need to feed this one before we can receive its blessing. Mana enriched horse feed is a mysterious invention, but Grayston says that its creator is a Meredith Carlson, who lives up in South Shore. So let's head there first. After a long flight north, we can find Meredith at her stables on the edge of the village. She's a bit eccentric, and is a bit annoyed at paladins like hers for doubting the properties of her invention. The horse feed is created from enriched mana biscuits, and we need to bring her 20. She also demands 50 gold in compensation for her misery from having her creation rejected by the Silver Hand. In a perfect world, this would have nothing to do with us, but this is not a perfect world. Enriched mana biscuits are the perfect travel ration for paladins, and I always carried a hundred or so with me. But if you don't have them, you can buy them exclusively from the Argent Dawn, back up north in the Plaguelands. To purchase them, however, you must be friendly with the Argent Dawn faction. If you've spent some time helping them cleanse the Plaguelands, and you've cleared out the streets of Stratholm a couple of times, you may have already met the requirements. If you haven't, I believe you can actually get other players to buy you some. But as you're not on good enough terms with the Argent Dawn, you can't physically put the biscuits into your mouth, which is funny. After handing Meredith the biscuits and a large sum of gold, she recognises that we had nothing to do with her rejection, but still takes the money regardless. Horse feed in hand, it's time we crossed the pond Greetings. to Kalimdor. In my first video, I took a ship from Menethil Harbour, and that is the best route for us to take, but let's mix things up a little. So far we've only visited places north of Stormwind, but now it's time to go to the south of the Eastern Kingdoms, all the way to the Stranglethorn Vale, a peninsula at the very bottom of the map. At almost the southmost point is the settlement of Booty Bay, a goblin-run pirate city which enjoys its neutrality in the Fourth War between the Horde and the Alliance. Because of this, 
Players of the two factions can freely intermingle under the close eye of the guards. The place even has a separate auction house where the two halves of World of Warcraft's economies can connect, but we're here for the ship that docks at the port and then sails westward. After a short voyage we arrive in Ratchet, another goblin run settlement. The same laws of neutrality apply here too, but I have had experience of being violently killed only a few steps onto land, so be careful. The capital of the Horde, Orgrimmar, is just to the north of here, so we're definitely not in friendly territory. Diamol is a huge, long abandoned elven city in the middle of the jungle of Feralas. As an alliance player, the path is long and dangerous, but as a level 60, we're likely well aware of the local flight masters, and so can skip the long ride through the barrens and the thousand needles. The furthest we can go by a flight is the small night elven outpost of Thalinar, right on the borders where the needles and the jungle meet. Following the road west will take us straight through Camp Majache and the horde inside, so to avoid certain death we can go around to the north, crossing this stream and taking care not to cross paths with several kinds of enemies along the way. Once we've gone past the horde camp we can get back onto the road. It snakes around the elevation of the jungle, and there's a particular spot that's paved under the roots of a huge tree, and that's cool. Thousands of years later, the ruins of Diamore are still imposing. The place is a huge dungeon, but split into thirds to make it more digestible. There's the Warpwood Quarter, the Capitol Gardens, and the Gordok Commons, or Diamore East, West, and North. Our business is West on the left side of the Broken Commons, not far from the entrance, by the Golden Statues, but the door is locked. It requires the Crescent Key, which we can find in the Warpwood Quarter to the east. At the start of that dungeon, you'll come across a little imp called Pusilin. He makes you mockingly chase him around the instance, but by the end of it, you can chase him down and snuff him out. Amongst other things, he drops the key. Let's get out of this quarter and back on track. The door opens out into the Capitol Gardens, on the far side of which is Tendris. Tendris Warpwood is the first boss in this part of the city, and should we have an able group with us, easy prey. Upon its death, the ancient equine spirit appears before us. The spirit readily tucks into the feed once offered, and afterwards lets us place the barding on its back. When we remove the barding, it is blessed. Let's hearth back to Stormwind and show Grayson. The time for us to win our mount draws near, but there's one final task left. To tame our charger, a divination scry is required, and for once, most of the work has actually been done for us. Its most important component was the exorcism sensor from the first step of our quest, but the scryer's power needs to be focused through two gemstones, one white and one black. For the white gem, we need to get our hands on an Azerothian diamond, and for the black, a pristine black diamond. Azerothian diamonds are found rarely in rich thorium veins, just like arcane crystals. Its counterpart is on the corpses of elite endgame enemies, usually from dungeons. For the sake of brevity, and my sanity, we'll skip the trip from the city and assume we've already gotten our hands on both. Lord Grayson Shadowbreaker gives us our divination scryer and reveals our true test. Hidden in the depths of Ker Darrow is the School of the Dead, Scholomance, a training ground for the necromancers of the Scourge and in the depths of the Scholomance is the Great Ossuary, a large chamber of thousands of bones. Amongst these bones are the remains of a once noble charger, whose spirit has since been resurrected by the Death Knight Dark Reaver to serve as his mount. I think it's time we took back what was stolen. Blessed Arcanite Barding and Divination Scryer in hand, it's time for us to take our final flight, north again to Lordaeron. Landing in Chillwind Camp, we once again need to head east through the graveyard, over this waterfall, and onto the bridge into Darrow. The settlement surrounding the keep is silent and empty, to the naked eye at least. Approaching the Care Darrow itself, we find that there's a locked door in the way. Rogues can pick it open, and engineers can blow it open, and if there's already a play on the other side, they can just open it from behind. But assuming none of those methods are open to us, we need to get the key. Back in Chillwind Camp, the Argent Dawn also want to gain access to the school. The local alchemist, Arbington, thinks he knows how to make the key, and the camp's commander entrusts us with following up on that lead. The key, called the Skeleton Key, is made from the remains of, well, skeletons, and so we need to return to him with 15 skeletal fragments. Handing in the fragments, he imbues them with the magic required, and tells us that now we have the material, we need the mould for the key. Arbington knows a blacksmith who specialises in moulds, and we should go to see for further instructions. He is a goblin in Tanaris in Kalimdor.
Arriving in Gadgetzan a long time later, we find our contact, Crinkle Goodsteel. He's got the mold prepared for us already, and he'll give it to us for 15 gold. It's a lot of money, but at this point I just want to get it all over and done with. Unfortunately for us, the fires needed to forge this key are much hotter than a normal blacksmith's forge, and we also need to get our hands on two thorium bars for the process. As for the bars, Gadgetzan has its own branch of the Goblin Auction House I mentioned earlier. We can get them from there and hopefully not get ripped off. As for the required heat, he recommends Fire Plume Ridge, located in the Ungoro Crater, a huge hole in the ground to the southwest of Tanaris that's full of jungle and dinosaurs. The ride through the desert of Tanaris is long, but not too dangerous. Though as we follow the beaten path down into the crater, we should be quite careful as some of these dinosaurs are huge. Near the centre of the crater is the ridge, a volcanic mound full of fire elementals. At its peak is a lake of lava, and in its heat we can forge the skeleton key. Now I swear this is the final flight. Back in Chillwind Camp, Arbington tells us that the key is missing one final piece, the sigil of Scholomancer's overlord. The Academy's current owner is safely nestled inside the dungeon, but its previous owner, the Lich Araj the Summoner, now resides in the nearby town of Anderhol and rules over the place. In case you don't remember, this is the very dangerous area we had to avoid at the start of our adventure. An assault on Anderhol is no easy feat, and just like with a dungeon, we'll need a group to pull the assassination off. After the slow process of wiping out the undead guarding him, we can slay Araj, destroying his physical form. As he is a lich, his soul is stored in his phylactery, and from it we can claim his sigil, the Scarab. When we take it back to Arbington, he glues it onto the skeleton key, finally completing it. So, now we can get into Scholomance. The place is full of necromancers and their minions, and it's perhaps the most challenging dungeon instance in the game. Progression requires skill, tact, and teamwork. And if you have enough of all three, it won't be too long before you reach the Great Ossuary. The place needs to be cleared out first. Many of the bones interred are still walking, most notably the boss Rattlegore, a huge golem of bones with razor-like arms. You can get down there by jumping down any of the holes on the left of the above room, or by going down the stairs, like a civilised person. Once the place has been emptied of enemies, it's time to take out our divination scryer and begin the ritual. Placing it on the large mound of dirt will start an assault of the spirits of the dead, rising from the bones we're standing on. There are many of them, and they're very dangerous, and they attack in four different waves. This is where our utility as a paladin will truly shine. The first wave of spirits are of banality. Judging one of them with our seal of wisdom will cause a holy explosion, heavily damaging and stunning all of the spirits nearby. The second wave is of malice, and it can be countered by our seal of justice. The third is of corruption, and is the hardest of the lot, as they're all elite enemies, but is countered by our seal of righteousness. The final wave is of shadow and is repelled by our seal of light. When the last of the ghosts have been beaten back, our fated nemesis arrives, the Death Knight Dark Reaver atop his Death Charger. It's a tough fight, and his ability to mind control is particularly dangerous, but we've not come all of this way just to fail here. Once the deed is done, the spirit of the fallen charger is left lost, meandering around the chamber. But thanks to the scryer, we hold the charger's lost soul in our hands. We give the horse back its dignity, and when we place our blessed Arcanite Barding onto its back, we judge it redeemed. Saddled atop our new steed, the fruit of our countless trials, tests and tribulations is clear for everyone to see. We're no longer just another adventurer. We're a hero.